What's this? <laughs> Shall I hold this? <laughs> While I do the intro. <laughs> I bet I'll just do this. Is that on, is it? Yeah. Oh, right, it's been on. I've got to just film the intro. Don't play the piano. Stop it. Hello. Hello. My name is Charlie from the Way Biblical Fellowship. <laughs> I don't know why I've got this barkeeper here now. Anyway. Um, oh, yeah. This week's Torah portion was called By a Slack. And in it, we looked at um, not fearing man, but fearing God instead. And um, we talked about surrendering to the Lord, not being an almost person as well. And um, we looked at bringing glory to the name of Jehovah. So um, I hope you enjoy it from me and him. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers, man. <laughs> Uh, hello, 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 hello everyone, Hi. new people as well, hello, <laughs> um, okay, this week's Torah portion is called Vyashlak and he sent, <coughs> when I'm putting the Torah portion together, before I do it, I always pray, Lord help me and, you know, show me what it is that I'm supposed to do, I was putting this together and I got to the end of part one and I thought, I've only used one verse of the Torah portion, <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know why that was, um, and I always say to myself, I'll just do a nice little one, everyone will be dead made up, <laughs> it'll be great, it just didn't happen that way, so um, we're going to zip through it pretty quick, okay, so here we go, Hosea 12, 4 to 5, in this Torah portion is the big wrestling match, so bear this in mind as we go through the rest of the Torah portion. Yea, he, Jacob, had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. Even Yehovah, Elohim, Zavayot, Yehovah is his memorial. Okay, and we'll get to that bit later. But it begins with, And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. Now the first verse of our Torah reading gives us clues that we're returning to the subject of selling the birthright. This is all about Jacob returning to his past. And you can see that in the language that's used. Seir means shaggy or hairy, refers to Esau's appearance. <coughs> field said that Esau was a man of the field. Isaac uh, sent to Esau out to the field to get venison. And Edom means red, refers to the stew that Jacob used to purchase the birthright. So... The time has come for Jacob to go back home. There are storm clouds on the horizon for Jacob. Can you imagine what the situation was when he left and he's thinking, ah, I've got to go back. He finds himself facing his fears and facing his past. He's a bit scared. He's definitely not in his comfort zone. Woo! <laughs> I love that picture, I don't know. Fresh from a dramatic confrontation with Levan on the hills of Gilead, Yaakov begins the Parsha closer than he has been in 20 years to facing a challenge even greater than the recent confrontation with Levan. As we read last week, he tried to flee Levan. Levan caught up with him and kind of said, hey, hang on a minute, what's going on here? He must now deal with the fearsome wrath of his brother Esau, the same wrath which caused him to flee the land of Israel 20 years ago. Didn't leave on good terms, did they? And if you remember from Parsha told that, that Jacob and Esau didn't even get on in the womb. It says, the children struggled together within her, and she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of Yehovah. And the Hebrew verb root used to describe the trauma is ratzaz. I've said that wrong, I'm like, ratzatz. It is the verb used in one place to describe the force necessary to smash a man's skull. This is when they were in the womb. This is before he, he completely and utterly tricked him. You don't, you don't, it's not going to go well, is it? Then, age 70, Jacob managed to completely endear himself to his brother by deceitfully stealing his blessing. Before Jacob left for Padana Ram, his mother told him that Esau was planning to kill him. So I reckon Jacob was pretty terrified at the thought of bumping into Esau. The man his father, Isaac, said would live by the sword. I'd be quite scared, I think. There's this man who's terrified, who lives by the sword. Didn't even get on with him when I was in the womb. I've completely done his head in now and he's promised to kill me. 
You can understand, can't you? Just think in terms, we can read it and go, yeah, just put yourself in this situation. And ask yourself this, have you ever been scared of something or someone? So Jacob was journeying into the land of Edom, the country of Esau, the brother who hated him. And in Matthew 10, Yeshua sends out the 12 disciples. This is interesting to me. This. He says, you will be hated by all for my namesake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Jacob was going to meet his brother who hated him. He was fearful. We get sent into a world that hates us. We live in a world that hates us for his namesake. Are you prepared to be hated for his namesake? Are you hated for his namesake? He then goes on to tell them this. A disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? He's not very popular, is he? Jesus Christ is not very popular. Can you imagine how popular Yeshua HaMashiach is? The true Messiah in his full identity. He's not popular at all. If they've called him Beelzebub, how much more will they malign us? People have been persecuted throughout the ages for their faith. Horrifically so. Often by people who call themselves God's people. It was the religious leaders of Yeshua's day who led the charge against him. It's interesting, isn't it? Why should we expect it to be different for us? In Isaiah 66, it says, Hear the word of Yehovah, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you and cast you out for my name's sake have said, Let Yehovah be glorified that we may see your joy. The Lord says this though, but it is they who shall be put to shame. <coughs> Are you one of those who trembles at his word? Chances are there are many people out there who would call you brother in Christ, who would hate you. Woe to you though when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. I would rather be maligned just as Yeshua was. And have the world say, you're great. I wouldn't want to be one of these people who makes the front cover of Time magazine. <coughs> I wouldn't. She says, have no fear. He says this, have no fear of them for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. I take amazing comfort in that. <coughs> Never be afraid to speak the truth because all will be made known. Don't be afraid to speak the truth as you were led by the Lord to do so. When they laugh at you, don't worry about it. Seriously, don't worry about it. Big deal. Nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Christians will hate us. People of all faiths will hate us. Atheists will hate us. Philosophers, humanists, nasty people and nice people will all hate us. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. They will level moralistic and scientific arguments at us that all deny the truth, the truth that is his word. You get these people, don't you? Call us idiots. <clears throat> the wisdom of the world, though, is folly with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And it's not just the scientifically minded people either. There's all these other people with their own theories of what's going on in the world and think they're so clever and think they've got all the answers. They think we're quite hateful too and they don't particularly like us. But all things will be revealed. When they lie about you or misrepresent you, don't worry. The Lord says this, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. He says you're blessed. That's good. Yeshua says you're blessed. That's amazing. They will say that we are unloving for doing what? For following the way of the truth. We will be labelled as bigots, we will be called backward, possibly accused of being mentally ill. And very often, it's, it is odd, but a lot of people who call themselves Christians accuse us of being unloving. Because we don't speak ear things, because we speak the truth. 
There's a man of lawlessness calling for a one world religion. He says that Adam and Eve are a fable. He says all religions are true. This is what the world is following after. He said this, but I don't believe, Father, I'm an atheist. But do good, we will meet one another there. <laughs> Where's he going to meet people? I wouldn't want to go. The Third Vatican Council concluded today with Pope Francis announcing that Catholicism is now a modern and reasonable religion which has undergone evolutionary changes. The time has come to abandon all intolerance. We must recognize that religious truth evolves and changes. Truth is not absolute or set in stone. Wow! In a speech that shocked many, the Pope claimed all religions are true because they are true in the hearts of all those who believe in them. What other kind of truth is there? In the past, the church has been harsh on those it deemed morally wrong or sinful. Today, we no longer judge. Like a loving father, we never condemn our children. Our church is big enough for heterosexuals, homosexuals, for the pro-life and the pro-choice, for conservatives and liberals, even communists are welcome and have joined us. We all love and worship the same God. The Bible is a beautiful holy book, but all great and ancient works, some passages are outdated. Some even call for intolerance or judgment. The time has come to see these verses as later interpolations, contrary to the message of love and truth, which otherwise radiates through Scripture. In accordance with our new understanding, we will begin to ordain women as cardinals, bishops as bishops and priests, and in the future it is my hope that we will have a woman pope one day. He did actually have a woman pope once. That's why they, when they get inaugurated, they have to be carried across. In, there's like a star, and a priest has to lie down while the priest gets wheeled across the top in a chair. And the reason is so that he can look up and check if it's a man or not. <laughs> That's nuts, then. <that> <clears throat> And all this kind of thinking has come along. We've got things like, it's not just Catholicism, you've got the emerging church. Reducing the emerging church to innovative and unconventional method methodologies would be a mistake. It goes deeper than just methodology. The emerging church movement marks a phil philosophical and social shift to make the church relevant to postmodern society. Oh, I hate it. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. What is truth? The Pope hasn't got a clue. He should read the Bible. <laughs> Thy law is the truth. James 1.25 But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer, who forgets, but a do at your acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Not only is it the truth, it is perfect. Don't add to it and don't take away from it. And Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He doesn't care what you call yourself, postmodern, past modern, pre modern. Doesn't matter. In October 1999, the Pope presided at a special council of some 2,000 religious leaders of various faiths, sects, and cults. The pontiff told assembled Buddhist monks, Zoroastrian priests, Catholic cardinals, Hindu gurus, American Indian shaman, Jewish rabbis, and ecumenical clergy that all must join in condemning Christian fundamentalists who abuse hate speech and whose efforts at others. Uh, incites hatred and violence, hate speech to speak the truth. All present were in agreement on two points. Pope John Paul II was endorsed by consensus as the planet's chief spiritual guide and overseer. Religious fundamentalists who refuse to go along with the global ecumenical movement are to be silenced, it means killed. They must be denounced as dangerous extremists full of hate. Wow, for believing the words of the Almighty, dangerous extremists. 1 John 4 to 4 to 8 says this Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. But we are from God. <coughs> Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. <coughs> Don't expect to fit into the world. Don't expect to. Don't expect the world to welcome you with loving arms. Oh, you're marvelous. We love what you speak, marvelous. It's not going to happen. But don't be afraid to speak the truth. Don't be afraid. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. For those who say that we don't know about love, that's nonsense. Torah is all about teaching us how to love. It teaches how we are to love both Yehovah and our neighbor. And we really, 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 really need to love each other. 
Because we live in a world that hates us. And when Joe says, Mishpachah, family, family, that's precious. It's so incredibly precious. We're his people. We're not of the world. We must recognize that in each other and appreciate it. Have no fear. He says this, What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. This is Yeshua speaking to his disciples. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in and hell. That's in Gehenna. Fear the Almighty. Don't fear man. You may be well all macho and say that you're scared of no one. Dodgy picture turn. <laughs> But stop and have a think. <laughs> Other dodgy picture. <laughs> Maybe what you're scared of is what people think of you or what they will say about you. There's different ways to be afraid of man. He says this, you say, well, not two sparrows sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. That, that verse, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. When I was a lad, I think I've told some of you. I was sat on a bridge in Wales, and um, <clears throat> these people were like real bad punks and stuff, and they came up to me. I mean, I mean punks, not like in the American slang. They had like Mohicans and stuff and safety pins. And One of them said, he's going to push him off. Fear. And I just thought, oh, that's great, isn't it? Because <laughs> I had a look down and it was pretty high up. <laughs> and I turned to them and I said to them, I said, he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. And they were freaked out. And then I said to them, every hair on my head is numbered. And they were like, whoa. And they actually backed off at the end of our exchange saying, he's got 666 tattooed on his head, you know. <laughs> and they all just left. It's incredible, isn't it? So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. We deny him every time we act in a way that tells people that he is not our master. Every time we do things like failing to keep the Sabbath holy, or refuse to wear tzitzit, or act unlovingly towards the vulnerable, we deny him before men. Do you deny him? Even within our families, within our own homes, we can find ourselves despised for living righteously and declaring the truth and acknowledging Yeshua. Does the fear of being rejected by those you love cause you to deny Yeshua? And I want you to think at this time, when we're coming up to Christmas, a lot of people feel pressured. Like, you know, oh, for the sake of the kids and this and that and my auntie Bethel. Oh. Hang on a minute. Do not deny Yeshua, do not deny him. Acknowledge him in all things at all times. Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. Put me anti better little kick off, it'll be shocking. <laughs> I haven't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against their mother and a daughter-in-law against their mother. And, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You have to know him to know that that is true. Two Timothy three twelve to seventeen. He says this indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Yeshua Hamashiach will be persecuted. If you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you're not of the world, because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. This is Hebrews eleven talking about the prophets. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourges, yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And I think this bit is amazing. Of whom the world was not worthy. 
That's how the Lord views people who make a stand for his truth, who acknowledge him. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. 2 Timothy 3, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue with what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from who you've learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are to make you wise for salvation through faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. What do you think it was that they learned from childhood? It was the Torah. To make you wise for salvation through faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And Yeshua says this, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. How are we equipped for these good works? By training in righteousness through the scriptures. Good works. Is that good works? There he is, Obama, doing his food kitchen thing. Oh, how marvelous! Saint Obama! Good works are not about following your own altruistic intentions, no matter how noble they may be. <coughs> Sorry. That won't bring glory to Yehovah. <coughs> good works are all about following Scripture. All scriptures breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And these good works we do so that they may glorify our Father which is in heaven. Do not fear, you are the light of the world. Do not deny Yeshua, your Lord and Master. Let your light shine before men. Walk according to his word. His word trains you in righteousness that you might do the good works which testify of Jehovah and bring glory to his name. For we are his workmanship created in Yeshua HaMashiach unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The world hates us but be bold. Acknowledge Yeshua before men and live a life worthy of the gospel. They profess to know God but their deeds they deny him being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Don't deny him by your deeds. It's not about all about what you confess out your mouth, it's how you live your life. There were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow the pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Denying the Lord that bought them, causing the way of truth to be spoken evil of. So though that I deny Yeshua caused the way of truth to be spoken of in evil terms, and we know the way of truth is the Torah, as we saw before, thy Torah is the truth. Then Yeshua said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. To acknowledge Yeshua is to walk in the truth. It's to walk in the Torah. Torah is the perfect law of liberty. It sets you free. It is the law of truth. And if you want to acknowledge him, you must walk in the way of truth, the Torah. Those that deny him cause the way of truth to be spoken of in evil terms. So conversely, those that speak ill of the Torah or cause others to do so deny Yeshua. And they do it all over the place. They speak evil of the Torah. They call it bondage, a burden. Oh, Lord. They're denying Yeshua by doing this. Matthew 7, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of Torahlessness. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. They're going to come saying, yeah, Jesus, he's, he's the Christ, yeah. But they're going to deceive many. And that many sounds familiar. Could it be the many that cry out, Lord, Lord? On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord. There's the many. 
Depart from me, you workers of torturelessness. Is it because many will come in his name, saying that he is the Christ, and they will lead them astray? There's people all over this country who call him Lord, 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 but who have been deceived. And on that day they will say to him, Lord, Lord, it's us! And he'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who did not practice the Torah. You denied me by not walking in the way of truth. If you deny me, then I will deny you before the Father. We need to acknowledge him, to walk in his ways. That's how we do the good works that he wants us to, and that's how we bring glory to his name. Do you say that Yeshua or Jesus is the Messiah or the Christ, but yet cause people to go astray? Will Yeshua be telling you and those you have influenced depart from him for practicing Torahlessness, lawlessness? Do you speak ill of the Torah or cause other people to do so? I don't think anybody here does, but there may be people watching who do. Do you follow the teaching of those who bring upon themselves swift destruction? Even in the face of persecution and rejection, are you prepared to live righteously and thereby acknowledge your Messiah? Will you compromise for the sake of peace, a peace which Yeshua did not come to bring? Or do you play down who Yeshua truly is? He is the Word made flesh, and every time anyone messes with the Word, tries to make it more palatable to a lost world, then they deny Him. Or will you stand firm in His Word and love Him for all to see? Yeshua says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Every time you compromise, you play down who Yeshua truly is. You thereby deny him before men. Are you ashamed of him? That you would do that? He says, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Just think that that day is coming. Wow. Would you like for Yeshua to be ashamed of you when he comes in all his glory? To acknowledge Yeshua is to walk in the truth, that is to walk in the Torah so that men might see your good works and glorify Jehovah. And his truth sets you free. It is perfect and if we walk in it, it is life to us. Yeshua says that the world will hate us, but that we should not fear man, rather we should fear Yehovah. Would you rather have men's praise and have Yeshua deny you before the Father or be hated and know that Yeshua will acknowledge you? Do you want your life to bring glory to Yehovah when you think of all that he's done for you? It is our honor and privilege to live our lives in accordance with his word. We have his Torah written on our hearts. We are truly blessed. Isaiah 55 says this, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprouts, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent. Note that Yeshua is the word made flesh. And this is interesting. In Hebrew there is no word for it. And if you read this 55.11, it actually says... So shall my word, which is masculine, be that goeth forth out of my mouth. He shall not return to me void, but he shall accomplish that which I please, and he shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent him. He is the word made flesh. If you don't walk in his word, you deny him. Yeshua never said it would be easy for us to follow him, but he said he'd always be with us. He said if you endure, if we endure, we will also reign with him. And if we deny him, he will also deny us. I don't want to be in that situation. And this was a psalm that James sent to me in the week. And listen to this. You don't want to be denied when you think what's coming. Clap your hands, old people. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For Jehovah, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He will shall subdue peoples under us and nations under our feet. He shall choose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, Jehovah, with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth, sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. 
The rulers of the people are assembled with the God of Abraham. For God's mighty ones of the earth have been greatly exalted. Wow. That's good, isn't it? <laughs> Don't want the Lord coming back and being ashamed of you, do you really? You really want to be acknowledging him as best you can. As often as you can. Wherever you can. Whenever you can. So that he will acknowledge you. Let them now that fear Yehovah say that his mercy endures forever. I call upon Yehovah in distress. Yehovah answered me and set me in a large place. Yehovah is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Yehovah, take part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in Yehovah than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in Yehovah than to put confidence in princes. What can man do to you if you fear Yehovah? Don't fear man. Fear him. Yeshua sends us out into a world telling us not to fear man but to acknowledge him and let our light shine before men. Yehovah is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? They should be words out of our lips. Be bold enough to bring glory to Yehovah's name by walking in his word which is the way, the truth and the life. And as we shall see in our Parsha it is only when Jacob fully surrenders to Yehovah that he can truly say, Yehovah is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? If you want to be able to say those words confidently, then you need to be fully surrendered to Yehovah. Have you fully surrendered? Or are you still living in fear of man? Do you deny Yeshua by your words or by your deeds? Ask yourself truly, have you fully surrendered? It is only when you're fully surrendered that you can walk with boldness and proclaim on the housetops. That's what you have heard whispered. I want us to think back to Parsha told us when Isaac has rebuilt two wells that Abraham had dug that had been stopped up and both times he has suffered persecution and been forced to leave them to the local herdsmen. And as we read Genesis 26, we see that he builds a third well and has no trouble. Isaac's been through a time of testing, maybe some of you have, and he has done well. Isaac has not wandered from the way, and now Yehovah appears to him and reassures him. He said he appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And what did he do? He built an altar and he called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there, and Isaac's servants digged a well. So he called on the name of Yehovah and following this he finds peace with those around him, those who've been giving him trouble. Now, remember that at the time of a desert city's life it revolved around um, the well because of its life-giving water. So consider this, which is from the writings of Tony Robinson. It should be understood that each time Abraham dug a well he gave it a name that testified to some aspect of the true nature of Yehovah. Because of the importance of the well, everyone would be aware of its name. Thus, each well was to serve as a witness to all living in the area. When Abraham died, the locals reverted back to their idolatry and stopped up the wells in order to erase his teachings from their memory. That's his opinion of why they did it, because it doesn't make sense that they would bung up wells during a famine. Then Isaac returns. He digs the same wells and gives them the same names and resumes the witness of the greatness and the glory of the Almighty. He didn't look to do something new. And remember, prophetically speaking, he is a picture of Yeshua, where Abraham is a picture of the Father. There he is, just like Yeshua. He is a picture of Yeshua, and Abraham is a picture of the Father. Yeshua said, my doctrine is not mine, uh, but him that sent me. He wasn't trying to do anything new either. He said, I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me commandment what I should say and what I should speak. Yeshua only did what he saw the Father doing and we're only to do what we see Yeshua doing. He was without sin, which means he walked according to the Torah. Because whoever commits sin transgresses the Torah, for sin is the transgression of the Torah. He did not transgress the Torah. Jeremiah 6, 16. Let's say it, Yehovah, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. None of this, we're in the post modern stage, we must find a different way to do it now, to appeal to the masses. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. 
So have a think about what Isaac did. He went through a time of testing. He stood in the ways and he sought the old paths. He called upon the name of Jehovah, which led to peace. He was a light and a witness that testified to the goodness of Elohim. So what did the wells represent? I had to think about this and thought, what did they represent? They represented using the very thing that was central to your daily life, the thing which speaks of the provision and blessing of Jehovah, to be a witness to everyone of who Jehovah is and what he has done. We should also take the things that are central to our lives and let them be a testimony to the name of our Elohim. Think of all Jehovah's provision in your life and all the abundant blessing that he has given you. All these things should point people to Jehovah. All these things in your life, whether it's your marriage, your home, your job, your friendships, the hope that you have, the, the shalom that you enjoy, should all point people to who Jehovah is. Do the important things in your life testify to the greatness and goodness of Jehovah? Do you make the name of Jehovah known to others? Do they look and go, wow, your God's amazing? Do you profess boldly all that you have heard? His truths? Have you fully surrendered? He built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants dig the well. So what happens? Isaac sacrifices to Jehovah and goes on to find peace in the midst of all his mayhem. Is there a lesson for us in this? If we're suffering persecution, if we're having trouble, then we must look to Jehovah. So many people in such times go everywhere but to Jehovah. It's true. Oh, it's all going wrong. I'm off the pub. It's like, it's true. Jehovah is to be our refuge. We are to run to him. Now you can ask, are we to come before him with a sacrifice, just like Isaac did? Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. <coughs> oh yeah. So what might that entail? It is certainly no half-hearted thing for those who are betrothed to the Messiah. If you want to be considered the bride, consider this. The whole burnt offering. The, whole, the word whole comes from the Hebrew kalil, and the root of this word is kalal which means to be perfected, finished, or complete. And one of the cognates of this word is kala, which is the word for bride. Now the animal offered on this altar gave himself completely. So only those who have given themselves wholly on that altar are the bride. If you want to be considered to be the bride, then you have to completely give yourself. And if you want to call upon the name of Jehovah, then you should present yourself a living sacrifice every day. If you want to call, come before him in prayer, and say, Lord, please, may I find peace in the midst of all this nonsense. Then you have to be prepared to present yourself every day as a living sacrifice. That means to offer yourself fully every day. Do you want Jehovah's name to be glorified before men? Ask yourself this, do you? Is it a big deal to you? You're not really that bothered at all. Yeah, but, yeah. Or do you really want to? When you think about who he is and what he's done for you, and you think about how maligned his name is in the world. And how people disregard his word. And how people speak evilly of his truth. Do you not think, I want, it, I want glory to come to your name, Lord. This is wrong. When I find out that they destroyed his word and chopped it up. I, I, it really got me <coughs> hurt. I was like, how could they do this to you, Lord? That they would even chop up your word and mess about with it. It hurt me. I want his name to be glorified to you. Then you need to surrender and walk in his ways and let the blessings in your life be ascribed to him so that all around you might know his name. His name is his character, who he is. The very things that are central to you, who you are and how you live day to day need to be a statement for all to see that Yehovah is the one true Elohim. Yeshua says, do not fear. He says, acknowledge me. Don't deny him. Now, part of this week begins with Yaakov having not yet surrendered to Yehovah. He's a man who still lives in fear of other men. He still hasn't grasped his identity or his destiny. And William Bullock Sr. said something about integrity. He said this, Integrity means being true to one's identity and staying on course towards one's destiny. 
Integrity is a function of identity and destiny. And when identity is unclear and destiny is questionable, integrity is impossible. When you do not yet know who you are or what your destiny is, compromises do not even seem like compromises. Then he goes on to say, The world, you see, is full of flatteries and superficial people, full of human chameleons who live for popularity and therefore dress and talk and act and live, not according to the Holy One's plan for them, but in whatever manner they think will bring them the most advantage in a given situation. And the basis of it all is fear of man. And what will people think? What will they say about me? Will I be popular? Part two, Yaakov will begin to lay claim to his destiny. And we see this in the prayer that he prays when he's in desperation. And his true identity will be revealed when he finally surrenders himself to Yehovah in the big wrestling match. will finally become a man of integrity as he surrenders and he will overcome his fear of man. Do you know who you are? Have you grasped it? Are you aware of your destiny? By the way, he was aware of his destiny, Jacob. He prayed to the Lord and he actually prayed the words that the Lord had spoken to. Our destiny and the word of Jehovah are not separate. Do you have integrity? Do you fear God or do you fear man? She always tells us not to fear man but to fear our Elohim and we're going to come to a close now but consider this how did the apostles appear in the face of persecution yeah we strictly charge you not to teach in this name yet here you fill Jerusalem with your teachings and you intend to bring this man's blood on us Peter and the apostles said we must obey God rather than men don't be afraid that you might offend people you must obey God before men and when they are called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Shua and let them go. And they went off saying, that was terrible, what happened there, that was awful. They didn't. They left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And what did they do? They went on teaching from house to house. They weren't perturbed at all. And Paul, he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. And he spoke boldly in the name of Yeshua and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. They were trying to kill him. And he still spoke boldly. Wow. The brethren, when they knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent forth to Tarsus. And what did they do? The churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. And what were they doing? Walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Ruach HaKadosh. And they were multiplied. Tells us not to fear man, but to fear our Elohim. And someone once said, whatever you fear will become your God. You fear people saying you're ugly or not being liked and appreciated and thought of as attractive. Beauty will become your God. If you fear obscurity and people not really putting you on the pedestal you think you deserve to be, fame will become your God. Whatever you fear can become your God. Yeshua tells us to proclaim on the rooftops the truth we have heard. Yeshua tells us we are to be a light and to do the good works preordained for us in his word. This means choosing the old paths and walking in Yehovah's teaching and instruction his Torah and this is how we glorify his name we'll go through times of testing and Yehovah will reveal himself to us through our ordeals and with every revelation of who he is we are compelled to make his name known to take the things central to our lives and let them be a testimony to his goodness and those who call upon Yehovah are those who know all about sacrifice how grateful we should be how we should long for every chance to acknowledge him how could we deny him? How could we? How could we ever be ashamed of him? I was thinking this the other day. He's the most amazing man I ever walked on the earth. How could I ever be ashamed to call him my friend, my lord and my master? How could I ever want to do anything other than what he says to do? Because he's the only one who ever loved me that much. That it makes, it makes me want to weep. He melts my heart. How could I, how could I ever deny him? Acknowledge him in all ways, in every part of your life. We should be living lives that bear witness to our gratitude for what he's done to us. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. He watches over us. He takes care of us. And just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Just think what he's done for us. 
because he loved us so much. Mark this, then you will forget God, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. It's the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. The one who orders his ways rightly, I will show the salvation, the sure of God. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Thank him and if you've given your life to him, then give it. If you call him Lord, then let him be Lord of all that you are. Remember what Yeshua said it would take to be his disciple. Then when the day of trouble comes, he will deliver you and you need not fear man. So just in closing, for those that offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving, there is deliverance in times of trouble. These are the people that glorify him before men. Now when Isaac finally found peace with those around him, the king's word to him was, we see plainly that Jehovah has been with you. That's what these people said to him. The people say that to you. We see clearly that Jehovah has been with you. Let's be a people of thanks, a people surrender to Jehovah, a people that fear their Elohim and not man. Let's glorify his name by the way we live our lives. Acknowledge your Messiah and give thanks. And if you're struggling, he gives power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The only people who ever get to hear Jehovah utter the words fear not are those who fear him, not those who fear man. As in the fear of Jehovah, his strong confidence in his children shall have a place of refuge. The world's a scary place and scary times are coming. The scriptures are full of warnings, so let us hearken to his word. Let us hear and delight in his instruction. Let us fear him for that which he could do to us and let us always give thanks to him that he chooses to show us mercy and love. You, O God, are resplendent with light. You alone are to be feared. He who fears the Lord is a secure fortress and for his children it will be a refuge. The fear of Jehovah is a fountain of life turning a man from the snares of death. Fear Jehovah, all you, his holy people, for you will lack nothing. The fear of Jehovah is life, he who is full of it will rest untouched by evil. Jacob's going into a time in part two, he's terribly fearful. Maybe you're going through something that makes you feel really, really fearful. Don't fear man, fear God. And acknowledge him in every aspect of your life. And let the things that are central to your life be a testimony to his goodness and his mercy and his kindness and his provision. So that people will say, we see plainly that the Lord is with you. And they will glorify his name, what a thing. Amen. End of part one. Bye, <clears throat> Slack. Part two. Let's just get straight in there, eh? <laughs> Jacob sent messages before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. And I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I will find grace in thy sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. That's the last thing he wanted to do, wasn't it? Four hundred men with him. <sighs> Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, I can well imagine. And he divided the people that was with him, and the flocks and herds and the camels into two bands. And he said, If he saw come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. So let's be fair to Yaakov. He saw who had long ago gone vowed to kill Yaakov is riding toward him at a full gallop with an army of 400 men. You might be greatly distressed and afraid yourself, mightn't you? 400, he said. 400. Oh, that's nice. His distress leads to his first prayer. Fancy that. What a thing to have happened. Waiting until things get really bad before coming before Yehovah in prayer. Mind-boggling. <laughs> I don't know. And Yaakov said, O oh God, my father, of, my, of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which sayest unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. 
I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast shown unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. There's a lot of prophetic stuff in that as well, isn't it? Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And thou sayest, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So Yehovah first got Yaakov's attention when he was a terrified fugitive running for his life on the road to Haran. And the first God encounter of Yaakov's life was founded in a dramatic dream sequence during the course of which Yehovah made not only um, startling revelations of himself, but also startling series of promises. If we remember back to the Torah portion that JP did, Yaakov, what he's done here in his prayer that he's prayed, he's obviously held on to the words that Yehovah spoke to him back then. The words he spoke to him back then were, and behold, Yehovah stood above it and said, I am Yehovah, God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereupon thou liest to thee will I give it unto thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. And will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So this prayer that Yaakov has just prayed, when he's in great distress, and he's thinking, four four hundred men, is that four? Okay, it seems to represent him taking hold of his destiny. That prayer was based on what the Lord spoke to him 20 years ago, when the Lord came to him in a dream and spoke. He's praying them words back. Just as I said before, our destiny... And the Lord, the word of the Lord, they're not, you can't be separated, they're inseparable. He's realizing that if he is to be all that he was created to be, then he must heed the words of Yehovah, the God of his fathers. And it's the same for us. There you go. Now ask yourself, what do you pray? And you pray. And what do you want to be? All that Yehovah would have you to be. Or you according to your own plans and ambitions. Just think of the many times Jehovah has made himself known to you and he's reassured you. Do you remember these things in the times of trouble or do you forget? Think so many times in your life when you go, wow, I can't believe that. The Lord's so good, he's amazing. Yet you get to these times of trouble and so easily forget. Sometimes I think we forget what Yehovah might have revealed to us just even a month ago. Here's Jacob describing what had happened to him, the words that were spoken over to him 20 years ago. He recognized that they were precious. Never mind that we sometimes lose sight of the eternal promises he's made to us in his word. Just think about it. The things that he's done in your own life are incredible and testament to the fact that he is with you. And then you read his word and you think, wow. And our destiny and the word are inseparable. We might all do well to remember the amazing things that Yehovah has spoken over each one of us. And the incredible promises in his word to those who love him. Because they are remarkable. And it says, and he lodged there that same night and he took of that which he had came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. He's in this area here. He got 200 she-goats and 20 he-goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams. <laughs> Loads of them. 30 milk camels with their crops, 40 kine and 10 bulls, 20 she-asses and 10 foals, and I couldn't resist putting the pity of a camel in. <laughs> God always going to have a pity of a camel if you can. And he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves, and he said to his servants, Pass over before me and put a space betwixt drove and drove. And he commanded the foremost, saying, When Esau my brother meets thee, and ask thee, saying, Who art thou, and whither thou goest, and whose are these before thee? Then thou shalt say, They be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present unto my lord Esau, and behold, he also is behind us. Please note as we go through this, his language is always, I am the servant, you are the lord, I am your servant Esau. So he commanded he, the second and the third, and all that followed the drove, saying, On this manner shall you speak to Esau, when you find him. 
And say ye moreover, Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me. And afterward I will see his face, but eventually he will accept of me. So think back to the blessing that Jacob stole from Esau. It says this, and the blessing was, Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and the plenty of corn and wine, that people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's house sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that cursed thee, and blessed be he that blessed thee. So in this blessing that he stole, everything points to all this material wealth and the fact that he would have people bowing down to him. So what's Jacob doing? He's coming before Esau, his brother, giving him all kinds of material wealth, getting his men to bow down and say, Jacob is your servant. He's trying to make restitution, which actually is a big part of teshuva, which is repentance. Repentance isn't saying, oh, sorry. It's about turning. What he gave to Esau was nothing more than that which Yatzach had intended to give to Esau, the stuff of life, the dew of heaven, and the increase of the land. And in so doing, was he offering Esau the monetary equivalent of the very blessing he had deceived his father into giving him so long ago. Now, <clears throat> there's a bit in Scripture which I just want to read. It's to do with making restitution. It's a big part of the Torah. In Leviticus 6, it says this, If anyone sins and commits a breach of faith against Yehovah, by deceiving his neighbor in a matter of deposit or security or through robbery. Or if he has oppressed his neighbor or has found something lost and lied about it, swear him falsely. In any of all the things that people do and sin thereby, if he has sinned and has realized his guilt and will restore what he took by robbery or what he got by oppression or the de deposit that was committed to him or the thing lost that he found, or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore it in full and shall add a fifth to it and give it to him to whom it belongs on the day he realizes his guilt. Making restitution for the wrongs that you've done is a big part of teshuva. It's a big part of... Teshuva is all about restoring relationships, and this is a big part of it. Just saying sorry doesn't really cut it with the Lord. Sorry, doesn't cut it. In Hebrew, uh, in verse 20, it reads like this. Yaakov said, I will win him over with the gifts that are being sent ahead, and then I will face him. Hopefully he will forgive me. That's how it reads more in the Hebrew. And real forgiveness, he's after his brother to forgive him. Real forgiveness is only sought by one who knows that he has sinned and is truly sorry. Was Yaakov truly repentant? Or just because just he's terrified? So ask yourself, what is true repentance? And I thought this was interesting that I uh, discovered quite a while back. Elements of teshuva. This is repentance in the Hebrew. Letting go of the sin. Accepting that you are not going to do it anymore. Regret. And confession. Okay. Elements 1, 2 and 3 are all about distance and self, yourself from sin. In the present, the future and the past. Element four is different. And only when you've left sin behind, um, left sin in the past, present, and future, have you truly moved beyond the sin. Element four is different from the first three in that it is interpersonal. Confession, by the way, is a mitzvah, it's a commandment. A commanded to confess. You can't confess whilst holding on to sin. It's like getting mikvid while ho holding on to a dead insect, which makes you unclean. It's like saying, sorry I called you ugly, you hideous nerd lout. <laughs> it doesn't work. Elements 1, 2 and 3 can be described as self-improvement. Confession is about repairing damaged relationships. Remember, all sin is against Yehovah. And that relationship we want restored. The mitzvah of teshuva, i.e. confession, is to repair the relationship that you damaged. True repentance is all about restoring relationship. And confession is vital. Vidui is the Hebrew for confess or apologize. And the word thank you comes from the same root. Indeed, the word hada, hada ah in the Hebrew means sorry and thank you. Wow, that's a bit odd, isn't it? How are they related? They're connected because they're both about recognition. Thank you is recognizing the value of what someone has done for you and expressing it. Sorry is recognizing that what you did was wrong and admitting it and understanding why it was wrong. They both deal with unbalanced relationships. 
and they're both about restoring the balance in relationship. There's plenty of unbalance in Yaakov's relationships, isn't there? Now, we go on. So he went over, went the presence over before him and himself lodged that night in the company. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and he passed over the four Jabok. This essentially is the mikveh of Yaakov's family. It is a foreshadow of the latent mikveh of the crossing of the Jordan to enter into the promised land. Everything that they do is a foreshadow and it's, it's amazing. Now Yaakov, in addition to meaning he will wrestle, can mean emptying or pouring out. The mikveh made by Yaakov and his family at this time was not only a preparation for wrestling with the angel, but was an emptying, a pouring out of self and stuff. And such a mikveh is necessary for all of us, pouring out of self and stuff. The mikveh is to the Hebrew mindset, that is baptism by the way, in case anybody doesn't know what the Hebrew is. The baptism, the mikveh to the Hebrew mindset is an integral part of teshuva, of repentance, of restoring relationship, and of starting any significant new undertaking. Mikveh is symbolic of total submission to Yehovah's will, his words, and his ways. I know we had a go, what's it in me the other day? There you go, see if you can spot yourself. There's Kitty, woohoo! There's Mike and Claire who aren't here. I can't even see who that is. Is that Brian? Yeah. There's Brian. Yeah, there's Brian. There's Tommy. Hey. The one who was terrified of getting in the cold and wanted to dance about me. <laughs> and there's Jez. Hey, Amen. Now, <clears throat> here's a map to give you an idea of the kind of journeys that they were taking. There's Esau's journey. There's Jacob's journey. There's the Jacob River. Peniel. And that's Manahim. Okay, so we'll move on in the uh, narrative. He took them and he sent them over the brook and he sent over that he had. So he sent all his family across. Yeah, and it says, And Yaakov was left alone and there wrestled a man, the Hebrew, the word is ish, with him until the breaking of the day. So he's having a wrestling match with an ish. Ooh. Some read this as following. Jacob is alone yet in the dark. He is wrestling with a man. And they say, could Jacob be wrestling with himself? Jacob wronged his brother and felt guilt, which gave birth to fear. Thus we could say that Jacob's fleshly nature, each man, is wrestling with the spirit within him. And they use this as an analogy and point out that sin's desire is to always have mastery over our flesh. As pictured by Yehovah's warning to Cain, which said, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now the Hebraic word picture presented by the word ish is as follows. For those who don't know, every Hebrew letter has a picture, a pictograph with it. And from looking at the letters we can get an idea of the meaning of the words beyond just what the word says. The first letter, Aleph, portrays Yehovah. It's a picture of a bull. And it's a picture of the leader and it portrays Yehovah. The second letter, Yod, pictures a hand, the divine hand, and references the work of the potter, the craftsman. The third letter, Sheen, is a picture of ascending flames of fire representing the manifestation of the divine presence as in the burning bush of the fire sent from heaven to consume the flesh on the altar. So Ish can be seen to picture a physical manifestation of the divine presence. So when we read it, it says, And when he, Ish, this divine manifestation, saw that he prevailed not against him. Now please bear in mind what it's saying here. This is fascinating to me. When this divine manifestation saw that he could not prevail against Jacob, what did he do? He touched the hollow of his thigh. So it's not happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch the hollow of your thigh. Then what happens? He touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joints as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go for the day breaketh." And he said, this is Jacob, I will not let you go except you bless me. What's going on? <laughs> By the way, the thigh or the yarek. Remember when Abraham said, put your hand under me thigh and swear to me. Okay. He put his hand under there and it's, it can also mean loins. So when he said he touched his thigh and put him on it and he had a limp. Oh, it could mean something more delicate than just that bit of your leg there. Like that. There you go. <clears throat> and he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob or Jacob. There is a theme throughout Torah of concealment of identity. So this is an important question. 
Yaakov's name means deceiver and given his name this is essentially his moment of confession so what we are seeing is Yaakov making teshuva before we looked at teshuva repentance and we said what is the mitzvah of it it's confession he's making confession what is your name I am Yaakov so he's wrestling this isn't an easy thing that he's going through but he tells him his name 1 John 1 9 says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness confession is an important part of making teshuva the essential question by the way he asks him his name is whether Yeshua truly knows you yeah because you don't hear this do you I never knew you it was spoken to the people who thought they were saved and depart from me you who practice lawlessness lots of people call him Lord 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 does he know you and the Hebrew for that knowing is yada and it talks of intimacy like a man and a wife have we all know who the queen is will she know you you got asked before didn't you if you <laughs> met the queen because you lived in London there she is we all know who she is it's Queen Elizabeth does she know you try waltzing into the palace sometime oh yeah I know the queen that's not what's important is it does she know you no does the Lord know you does he look at you does he ask you your name and do you make confession does he know you and he said thy name shall be called no more Yaakov but Israel for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed and Yaakov asked him and said tell me I pray thee thy name and he said wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name and he blessed him there so Yaakov had disguised who he really was in the hope of obtaining the blessing dressed up like his brother didn't he each of us must answer God's question what is your name when we face who we really are we encounter God and we find our blessing and we find our true name on our true identity and we stand before him naked and make confession towards him you can't hide with the Lord you can't meet Yehovah wearing a mask I am so holy I am so holy <laughs> doesn't work there you go. Trace Obama. Oh, isn't he marvelous? He's crazy. When he was in the soup kitchen before, he's just lovely. He's amazing. Oh. Your church face is no use to anyone, least of all yourself. <laughs> because when you stand before God, He asks you what your name is. And you can't hide. The result of Jacob's confession is a name change from deceiver to the straight of El. El as in God that's Yashia meaning straight El gives us the word Israel it is when we make confession that we are forgiven and we become the straight of El no masks no whitewashed tombstones here thank you Israel derived from the Hebrew word Sar it actually means noble and eminence as well this is a great identity to take on I'd rather be Israel than a deceiver wouldn't you so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel saying for I have seen God face to face and yet my life has been delivered the sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel limping because of his hip <laughs> therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket because he touched the sockets of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh so what has just transpired let's have a think about it it's good isn't it he's the best he's Sherlock Holmes him he is the best this could be a three pipe mystery Boston what has just happened <laughs> in last week's Pasha JP mentioned how the Torah is structured in such a way as to teach us more than what can be found by reading individual accounts at face value and he did it in the Torah portion by Etsy he pointed it out to, to, and the, the whole message that I got from it was how incredible the scriptures are just, it's not like something you just take on face value there's an integral message in there and it's all laid in such a way as to just keep teaching and keep delivering his truth he talked about how stories are thematically related and that information lacking in one account is often given in a parallel account now bearing this in mind let's read on into chapter 33 to verse 17 which represents one huge Parsha this is something we call these a Parsha every week 
But a Parsha is actually like a paragraph as it's written in the Hebrew. And there's a Parsha Stuma and a Parsha Putak, is it? Or Patak. And what it is, when you've got these Parshas, they're basically, it, what it means is, this whole bit is linked. This whole bit is related. This is one big message, so treat it as one big message. So before we actually look, we'll read to the end of what the Lord, in his word, has said, is that this is one big Parsha. It says in chapter 33, And Yaakov lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him four hundred men. And he divided the children unto Leah, and unto Rachel, and unto the two handmaids. And he put his handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. So, before his wrestling match, he split everybody up into two groups, thinking, well, one of these might get killed, but the others might live. Now, he's brought them all together. He passed over before them, and what's he doing? He's bowing to his brother. Think of the blessing that he stole. Seven times until he came near to his brother. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. This is the Esau who sworn to kill him, who was arriving with 400 men. You don't do that if you're going to give someone a kiss. Uh, Gather 400 men, I'm going to kiss my brother. The one I swore I was going to kill. Okay. <laughs> it's got to be what else if I kiss. <laughs> now in the Hebrew scrolls a series of dots appear over the words and he kissed him you can see it it's generally agreed that dots indicate a secondary meaning within the phrase and most feel Esau's kiss was not completely genuine although Esau may have been overwhelmed by emotion at the sight of his brother something was lacking in the long term sincerity in his expression of love for his brother sort of like he was being nice to him but it wasn't really his first intention to be nice to him he lifted up his eyes and he saw the women and the children. He said, who are these with thee? And he said, the children which God hath graciously given thy servant. He's calling himself his servant again. And the handmaidens came near, they and their children. And what did they do? They prostrated themselves before him. And Leah also with their children came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near and Rachel and they bowed themselves. And he said, what meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother, keep that thou hast unto thyself. And Yaakov said, Nay, I pray thee, for I have found grace in thy sight. Then receive my presence at my hand, for therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou wast pleased with me. Take thee, I pray thee, what does he say? My blessing, bracha, that is brought to thee, because God had dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. And he said, let us take our journey and let us go and I will go before thee. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant and I will lead on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me. And the children be able to endure until I come unto my Lord unto see her. And Esau said, let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, what needeth? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. He keeps calling him his Lord, doesn't he? He said, take my blessing, take all these things. You are my Lord, I'll bow down, I'll bow down. So Esau returned that day on his way unto Seir. And Yaakov journeyed to Sukkoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore the name of the place is called Sukkoth. And as we mentioned earlier, the Torah uses parallel accounts to teach us on a deeper level. And what we have just read is actually a mirror of something from last week. It's from chapter 29, which mentioned three flocks of sheep. My brothers, where are you from? All this language is exactly the same. Then you've got Rachel coming, but as we see Esau coming. Then Jacob approached, and then we've got Jacob kissed Rachel and raised his voice and cried. All this language is mirrored in this account, yet it's with Esau instead of with Rachel. All the language is exactly, even the three flocks of sheep is exactly the same in this account that we've just read. So bear that in mind. This is how the scripture teaches us things on a deeper level. By one account is mirrored by another account. And it's, there's, there's something in there that we can learn. And Tony Robinson says, to understand this huge big Parsha, let's look at it like this. Genesis 32, 4-7. Jacob informs Esau of his return. Jacob prepares to meet Esau. Jacob wrestles with an angel. Jacob and Esau meet. Jacob and Esau part ways. It's a huge big Parsha. Now, what one word characterizes his state of being at the beginning fear Jacob is hurrying in fear he's extremely fearful for the lives of his family he actually splits them in two and then we have the wrestling incident okay 
The wrestling, okay, thinking about this again, the wrestling. It's a three piper. Who is the man? We know that is a divine manifestation. What happened to cause them to begin wrestling? Why did Jacob want the angel to bless him? So we've got the wrestling, there's a picture of them wrestling. Whoa. How did we get from Esau coming with an army of 400 men seemingly intent on annihilating Yaakov to the big embrace with kisses and tears? How's all this happened? Genesis 32, 8-22 What three things does Yaakov do in preparation for his meeting with Esau? Divides his family into two camps. He prayed asking Yehovah for help. And then he sent gifts to Esau in hopes he would appease his anger. Okay. And the 32.24 informs us that after making his three preparations, he turned in for the night. And then this guy, Yanach Waxman, said, his threefold preparation complete, Yaakov goes to sleep as ready as can be. Surprisingly, immediately after being informed of Yaakov's lying down for the night, and right before the story of the struggle, we find Yaakov up and about crossing the Yabok. In pointed contrast to the previous splitting of his camp, he gathers together all of his people and possessions. He is breaking camp and initiating a journey. Yaakov seems to have undergone a last minute change of plans. Why did he wake up in the night, gather his family and send them across the Jibok River? There's an old sage, that's what they look like by the way. Found a picture. So if you ever hear an old sage, there you go. There's an old, it looks like my dad. There's an old sage called Rashbam. We made an interesting connection between this tale and the story of David fleeing Absalom in 2 Samuel 17. So, at length, when you get your own time, read that account yourself. But the connections are such as this. Just as Jacob arose, so likewise David arose. Just as Jacob arose in the late night pre-dawn hours, so likewise David arose in the late night pre-dawn hours. Just as Jacob had all who were with him cross the river, so likewise David had all with him cross the river. Just as the verb stem for crossing appears three times to describe Jacob's late night crossing, so likewise the same stem appears three times describing David's late night crossing. Rashbam also noted that the two crossings occurred near each other geographically. David arrived in Machanaim after crossing the river and Jacob's last location was pinpointed at Machanaim. Both David and Jacob are fleeing from a close family relative. Because of the amazing thematic connections, Rashbam concluded that just as David was fleeing from Absalom, so likewise Jacob was fleeing from Esau. He's legging it. That's what he's doing. He's legging it. Therefore, Jehovah sent the angel to stop him from fleeing and wrestled. Furthermore, this would explain why Jacob's hip was injured to prevent him from fleeing. Remember when it says the Ish could not prevail with him. It's because the Ish was sent to stop him running away and Jacob was having none of it. So the Ish says, well, if you're just not going to listen, cop for that. (laughs) You're not going anywhere now, are you? There you go. I believe the angel was sent to keep him from running. Therefore, Yaakov could have been wrestling with the intent of freeing himself to continue his run away from Esau. However, that's not why he continued to wrestle with the angel so intensely. So he's in this crippled state now. But he carries on wrestling. Why does he carry on? I believe that after the angel prevented him from fleeing, Yaakov was forced to make a decision concerning his future. I believe it was at this point that he surrendered himself to Yehovah. Like okay, I keep trying to do it my way, deceiving, deception. What did he try? He tried to flee Levan. He tried to flee Esau 20 years earlier. He's always trying to leg it. I've tried to do it my way. At this point, he surrenders to Yehovah. He makes the transition from trying to manipulate and deceive, as he has done, to beginning to trust Yehovah to bring about his promises. All right, Lord, this is terrifying. This seems like the most ridiculous thing that you would even think to ask me to do, but I'm going to trust you. Instead of wrestling the angel to free himself so that he could continue his flight away from Esau, he wrestled the angel demanding to be blessed. All right, if we're going to do it your way, you need to bless me. You've crippled me, now bless me. (laughs) Tony Robinson, he said, it's as if he said, okay, I'm not going to do it things my way anymore. I'll do it your way. However, I know it won't work your way unless I have your blessing. 
Therefore, I'm not going anywhere until I get just that, your blessing. After the wrestling match, has Yaakov changed? After his big struggle, do we see change? Earlier in Genesis 32, Yaakov had divided his family into two camps because he feared Esau would attack them. He wanted to ensure the survival of at least a portion of his family. This time, however, Jacob does not divide them into two camps. He simply divides them or puts them in an order to meet Esau. If he was still fearful for his life, wouldn't he have kept them in two separate camps still, as he had previously planned? He's a changed man. He has surrendered to the Lord, and he is no longer fearful of man. He is no longer Jacob the supplanter, he is Israel, he has surrendered to Yehovah, he is Israel who has been blessed by Yehovah. Therefore, what can Esau do to him, apart from it being the will of the Holy One? What a place to be, to live your life. It makes me think of JP that, because he often says things like that. Because the Lord God Almighty is sovereign. What can anyone do unless it be the will of the Lord? Even if it might seem ridiculous and it might seem like the most stupid thing to do. Makes no odds. Nothing can come of any harm to us. Lest the Lord allow it. And all things ultimately work for the good of those who love him. Scary things come in your life. Just surrender to him. Don't run away. Don't fear man, fear Yehovah. Israel's become a man of integrity. He prayed, he started to recognize his destiny and that it's tied up in the words of Yehovah. And he surrendered. He's confessed to who he is. And now, he's found out his true identity. And he's a man of integrity. Earlier in the Parsha, we said, it is only when Yaakov fully surrenders to Yehovah that he can truly say, Yehovah is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Wow. During the wrestling match was the moment he surrendered. Have you had your moment? Or are you still trying to run away? Please note that it is foolishness to strive with Yehovah. Job says this. Truly, I know that it is so, but how can, a, how can a man be in the right before God? If one wished to contend with him, one could not answer him once in a thousand times. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and succeeded. Why even try to struggle with the Lord Almighty? Do you fear God, O oh man? If you still fear man and are not bold enough in acknowledging your Elohim, then you have not surrendered, and you are running away from your true identity and from your destiny. Why would you live in fear of man and set yourself to strive with Yehovah rather than to yield to him and his will for your life? Job 23, he is unchangeable and who can turn him back? Talking about Yehovah. What he desires, that he does. For he will complete what he appoints for me. And many such things are in his mind, even if he has to destroy me, Yarek. Therefore I am terrified at his presence when I consider I am in dread of him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. Fear God, not man. There are far too many people who know Yehovah's name who are trying to run away and do things their own way. They may well know Yehovah's name. The thing is, does he know them? Perhaps Yehovah will stop them in their tracks and ask them their name. That could be quite a painful experience. Perhaps they will confess and surrender. Perhaps then they will be blessed and be all that they are meant to be. Certain in their true identity and sure of their destiny in Yehovah. People of integrity. People of faith. Why not just surrender? Do you really want Yehovah to come and bust you up? And before moving on, there you got the wrestling. How did we get from Esau coming with an army of 400 men, seemingly intent on annihilating Yaakov? There he is. To the big embrace with kisses and tears. How did that happen? I think the answer lies in the parallel account of Yaakov's dealings with Levan. Remember, Levan was coming and he had bad intent. What's he done? He's ran off and up. I certainly followed him with all his men. Wasn't going to go well for him then, was it? He saw, I believe, the same things going on. We are told that Yaakov fled Levan and that when Levan realized he pursued Yaakov with his kinsmen, 
I don't think it was going to go well for Yaakov. That is, until Yehovah came to Levan in a dream in the night and warned him not to say anything to Yaakov, either good or bad. The Lord stepped in and protected Yaakov. I believe Esau was originally approaching Yaakov with the intent of killing him, just as was implied, turning up with his 400 men. However, I believe that after dealing with Yaakov, Yehovah dealt with Esau. I believe Esau's heart was softened towards Yaakov as a direct result of Yaakov coming to terms with how he had been living his life. In other words, Esau's changed character is a direct fulfillment of the blessing Yaakov received from the angel. When we surrender to the Almighty, when we say, Lord, okay, I'm going to do it your way. All things work for the good of those who love him. We need not fear. The Lord can achieve more in a second than we can do in 10 years of worrying and trying to figure things out. Because he's incredible. Things that are going on that you might not even know about it, every time you surrender, the Lord is working things for your good. He's amazing. We need not fear. Things that might seem terrifying, the Lord can deal with them so easily. Throughout this narrative, note how many times Yaakov refers to Esau as master or brother and how often he referred to himself as Esau's servant. Note that Yaakov bowed to Esau seven times. All Jacob's actions are a complete reversal of everything the blessings which he stole stand for. The blessing given to Yaakov stated that Yaakov was to be a lord to your kinsmen. Furthermore, Isaac said, your mother's sons will prostrate themselves to you. So what's going on here? It's the exact opposite that's occurring. Yaakov is calling Esau Lord and bowing to him as well. And remember that during her pregnancy, Rivka was concerned because something frightening and dangerous was taking place in her womb. Something really bad. Remember we said they were struggling, like the struggle of somebody smashing a skull. So she consulted Yehovah. She goes to her and she prays and he says to her, Yehovah said, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And we saw that in this phrase, the older shall serve the younger, it's ambiguous in the Hebrew. If we were certain of the phrase being interpreted, the older shall serve the younger, it should be written like this. Instead, the Hebrew appears without this. What is this? It's the Aleph and the Tav, the Et. The purpose of the Aleph and the Tav would be to introduce the object without a doubt making the older the subject and the younger the object of the phrase. However, in the absence of the Aleph and the Tav, one may just as easily interpret the phrase to say the older shall be served by the younger. In Biblical Hebrew, it is typically the subject that is mentioned first in such a statement. However, there are also places where they are reversed. Could we say the deliberate vagueness is there to emphasize the oscillating nature of the relationship between the two nations? Therefore, we see that the purpose of Rivka's painful pregnancy is to announce the emergence of two nations that will be in perpetual discord, disagreement, until eventually the younger Yaakov will win out. So this whole thing of what we've got here is Yaakov bowing down, bowing down and serving Esau. This is all prophesied, that it would go between the one and the other. And there we've got the Aleph and the Tav, and I think it's really significant. Because you could say that the phrase told to Rivka, the older shall serve the younger. That is, Esau shall serve Jacob, Edom will serve Israel. All dependent on the absence or the presence of the Aleph and the Tav. And the Aleph and the Tav, that should ring bells to all of us. As in Revelation he said, I come quickly, my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tav. That is the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So we could say that whether Israel serves Edom or Edom serves Israel is all dependent on the presence of Yeshua HaMashiach. Does this bear itself out when we look at prophecy? What does scripture say will happen when Yeshua, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tav, returns? When he comes back, we would expect to see that the older Edom will be serving the younger Israel. That's what we would expect to see, isn't it? In Revelation 3, 8 to 10, it says this, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. 
So the people he's talking to have just been identified as true Israel. The ones who have not denied his name and have kept his word. And then it says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. This is a reference to Esau or Edom who were dressing up as Jacob, Israel, to steal his blessing. So the first people, true Israel. The second people, Edom. And those who associate spiritually with Edom. Behold, I will make them come and do what? Bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. The older will serve the younger when the Aleph Tav comes back. Because you have kept my word about patience and endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. And this dates it as the end of the age. So that's telling us this whole struggle of who will serve who will eventually be the case that the older will serve the younger when the Aleph and the Tav comes back and that is Yeshua HaMashiach. And the older will bow down before true Israel. I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. As it is written, Yaakov I have loved, but Esau I have hated. That's from Malachi 1.3 as well. And if you want to know more about it, have a look at it. You might have seen it, but if not, have a look at the Torah portion, told that that was done two weeks ago. It is you I have loved. What a thing. Where Esau represents all those who hate Jacob, Yehovah says, they say I love them, but all along it is you that I have loved. We've got people like this who say, Goyim were born only to serve us. Without that, they have no place in the world, only to serve the people of Israel. I believe this is a man who identifies with Edom and not with true Israel. Religious fundamentalists who refuse to go along with the global ecumenical movement are to be silenced. They must be denounced as dangerous, full of hate extremists. In a world which hated you and called you haters, the Lord says, it is you I have loved. I've always loved you. What a thing when he comes back. I will make those who have been opposed to you, I will make them bow down before you, and I will tell them, no, I have loved you. It is you that I have loved. Please note that it is okay for Yehovah to hate Eden because he is righteous and just. But as for us, you shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. We don't hate them. The Lord's righteous and just, we're not. We don't do that. Even when they make comments like this, I don't believe that the Jewish state and modern Zionism would have been possible without Christian Zionism. We value our friends and we never forget them. And we think that you have helped and established here a powerful memorial to our friendship and our common ideals. Netanyahu, who also said, My opinion of Christian Zionists, they're scum, but don't tell them that. We need all the useful idiots we can get right now. Do not abhor Edom, your brother. So Yaakov has surrendered. Yaakov asks, yeah, Yehovah asks his name and he confesses he is deceiver. This is making teshuva. Then he attempts to make restitution to his brother and to heal their relationship. Also an act of teshuva. He says, Please take my blessing. Bracha, not Bechira, which was his birthright, that is brought to you because Elohim has dealt graciously with, me, graciously with me and because I have all. So he urged him and he took it. The wrestling match was the birth of Israel. Yaakov realized that his wealth and power came not from the earth, but from Yehovah. We should all realize this. Why would we struggle? We should just surrender to him. Like Yaakov, we must learn that the blessing comes from surrendering to Yehovah and that we cannot let go of the man that has so much power in our lives. Surrender to him and then wrestle. Grab hold of him as tightly as you can. Just like Yaakov did. And think this, Yeshua overcame the world and through faith we can follow in his footsteps. <coughs> These things I have spoken to you, he says, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. You're going to have a load of, load of bother. He tells us clear, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 
we need to keep a tight hold of him 1 John 5 4 for everyone born of Adonai overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world it's our faith all Jacob's life he has tried to secure the blessing even before his birth he strove for the blessing Jacob wants to lead until he wrestled with the angel he used every means to secure the blessing including physical struggling lopsided deals and deceit however note his attitude after wrestling with the angel he is repentant and furthermore he has placed himself in the role of servant the exact opposite of what he desires and Yeshua said this he sat down he called the twelve he said if any man desire to be first the same shall be last of all and servant of all will you surrender will you own up to who you are and seek to make restitution will you stop striving in your own strength and realize that it is from Yehovah that your wealth and your power comes when you have surrendered by the way the wrestling is not over our task is to grab whatever of him he makes available to us what of himself has he made available to us first and foremost he has made available to us all of his Torah and how precious it is how precious is his word grab tight hold of it There's such blessing in his word he says it is life to us his teaching his instruction his Torah is the perfect law of liberty what a blessing so happy wrestling I'm sure you will find many blessings and the party okay via Schlack and he sent part three which is shorter than the other part by the way so you'd be greatly relieved to hear it says and Yaakov came to Shilem a city of Shechem which is in the land of Canaan when he came to Padan Aram and pitched his tent before the city and he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor Shechem's father for a hundred pieces of money and he erected there an altar and he called it oh it's a funny one isn't it El, <laughs> El, 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 El Israel okay so just when all seemed to be going well oh what happens next chapter 34 and Dina the daughter of Leah which she bare unto Yaakov went out to see the daughters of the land there she's gone up oh, what's going on here oh, I've not heard of a nosy the mooch and she came the son of Hamor the Hivite prince of the country saw her and took her and lay with her and defiled her oh not good makes me think of this be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness i.e. lawlessness Torahlessness, and what communion hath light with darkness what fellowship does light have with darkness <clears throat> what fellowship does light have with darkness doesn't work out well in scripture it doesn't work out well in our lives either no she can okay there's a picture of it today we have a tendency to think that Yaakov was only here for a while but he was actually here for 10 years it might have been longer it might have been 20 years some people say it might have been 14 years I don't I can't I tried to get to the bottom of it and, and went up a blind alley he was there for a very long time let's just put it like that its location in the promised land is at the crossroads of trade and it makes it a convenient choice nice and convenient <coughs> it just happens to be 30 miles which is a day's journey from where Yaakov is actually meant to be so near but so far away when he first fled Esau Yehovah came to him in a dream if you remember and Yaakov took the stone that his head had slept on and he set it up for a pillar and he anointed it and he made a vow there in the dream Yehovah promised to be with him and to safely return him to his home one day and it was the dream that promised Yaakov to make his vow so it was all a bit scary for him and the Lord said I'm gonna sort you know and he's oh, made his big vow and this was how it went so early in the morning Yaakov took the stone that he had put under his head and he set it for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it called the name of that place Bethel 
But the name of the city was Lutz at the time, at, 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 at the first. Then Yaakov made a vow saying, If God will be with me and keep me in his way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then Yehovah shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for the pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. He's made a vow to return to the place where the Lord appeared to him and to give the Lord a tithe of everything that he's done. He's made this vow in his time of trouble. If you will look after me, if you will keep me safe. The Lord did all that and more. And yet 30 miles from where he's meant to be, in a place of convenience, he decides, oh, this is all right, isn't it? Just a day's journey away. He stops, and he ends up stopping there for 10 years. As a result, his daughter gets raped. When Yaakov is having trouble with Levan and his men, he was told by Yehovah to leave the land of Padan Aram, return to the land of his kindred. It's quite clear from what Yehovah says that he has not forgotten Yaakov's vow. He might have conveniently forgot about it, but the Lord hasn't. Because in Genesis 31, he says, I am the God of Bethel. Do you remember that place where you said you'd come back? <laughs> Bethel, not Shechem. Where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise, go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. So Yaakov has travelled to Shechem and set up an altar to Yehovah. Which is all well and good, but he's not where he's supposed to be. He made a vow when he was in danger, but now that things are going well, he seems to have forgotten and is settled in a place that is convenient for him. He's only a day's journey away from where he's supposed to be. Ask yourself, have you ever been an almost person before Yehovah? An almost person. Ooh. We've all made a vow, by the way, before Yehovah. Everyone that has been baptised has vowed to serve him. You've made a vow. You are Lord of my life. My life I give to you. So what happens to all most people who treat their vows lightly? They assimilate. They are no longer set apart. And the consequences are dire. Set apart, by the way, that's, that's what being holy is all about. What did his daughter do? She decided, I'll just go and mix with all the folk around. This is great. The consequences were dire. He was in a place he wasn't supposed to be. He was an almost person. He took his vows very lightly. As soon as our Pasha Dinah has raped them, when they finally leave, as we read later, they're all laden down with foreign gods and in need of new garments. They've let their surroundings corrupt them. The rest of the chapter deals with the outcome of the rape. Shechem wants to marry Dina, and Yaakov's sons deal deceitfully with him and his father, and ultimately judgment comes upon the whole town, which is interesting because Dina actually is the female version of Dan, which means judgment. And you can read it yourselves, but I'm sure you all know how the story goes. They say to the men of Shechem, well, all right, we'll, we'll have a relationship with you, and you can marry it if you all get circumcised. They get circumcised, and then Simeon and Levi go in and kill them all while they're all recovering. The whole event is not <clears throat> good. The JP actually goes into it in detail, actually, um, in last year's Torah portion and explains whether or not this is something that is right or wrong. And it says in verse 30, And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled to make me a stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. And they said, Should he deal with our sister as with a harlot? Jacob is now fearful of the inhabitants of the land that they might gather against him and kill him. Perhaps what he still had to recognize was that the primary threat to him and his family was that of assimilation. Because that is what was happening. That was, that, that was the most dangerous thing that was going on. He wasn't where he was meant to be. He took his vows lightly. And his family get laden down with foreign gods. His daughter goes wandering off and trying to fit in with the society around. That's where all the trouble came from. And we see what happens when people try to assimilate with their surroundings. Yaakov has built an altar, by the way. You know, he's declared that Yehovah is his God. But he's allowed his family 
to get laden down with foreign gods and to assimilate. And we see it in the church today. Always only Jesus and Jay-Z with all his Illuminati and all kinds of connections. And just in Bieber, and imagine all the people, the New Age National Anthem. No heaven, no hell, believe, no God, no. And why not have some worship leaders who are in a relationship with each other that the scripture says they shouldn't be? We don't judge the world. The world can do what they want. But if you're in covenant with the Lord, then we look at each other and we judge each other and we edify each other and we say, this is what the word of God says. This is the standard by which you live if you are in covenant with the Almighty. But they always say, only Jesus. And people can kid themselves. Sin is deceitful. And if we take our vows lightly, we can become assimilated. We can lose our holiness, our set-apartness. And we can be corrupted and it can be really dire for us. There's no real future in having fellowship with folk that think you're a dangerous extremist and full of hate as well. But all those people who profess love and tolerance, and oh, the one thing they can't tolerate is the people of God, the people who actually speak the truth. That's why we need each other so much. And that's why we should encourage each other to take our vows extremely seriously before the Lord God Almighty. When times of trouble come and we might make these big espousals of, oh, I'll do this, and declarations of what we're going to do and all this, and then it all goes well for us and it's all nice and easy, we're in this place of compromise and it's the center of trade and life's cool and cushy and our vows get taken less seriously. We should be there for each other, edifying each other and saying, no, 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 no. This isn't the way it's meant to be. Reminding each other, who is our Lord and Master? Who it is that we have made these vows to? The Almighty. The one who gives us the power to gain wealth. The one who gives us peace. The one who gives us joy. And I just think we really do need to realise how important it is for us to have fellowship. When we see people travelling from the likes of London to have fellowship, that's incredible, isn't it? That's a real testament to the fact that it is such a blessing for us to meet together and we need to watch out for each other. We're to be a set apart people, a holy people. Not a people of compromise. Not a people who fit in with the world. A people who stand out like a sore thumb, who shine like a light. Who acknowledge our Messiah in every aspect of our lives. So that we can bring glory to his name. And the more it costs us, the more glory it brings to his name. And the more persecution, we should say, rejoice, rejoice. The Lord God Almighty is our King. He is our Master and our Lord. And we've each made a vow to him. Bless his holy name. Let's watch out for each other, yeah? And it says, <clears throat> God said to Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau, thy brother. Jehovah reminds Jacob of his vow all that time ago that he made when he was in trouble. And he set up his stone. The first altar Jacob set up was an action of impulse of his own volition. And this one, 30 miles away, is on a site we've already come across. And this would be a Shema response. This would be hearing the Lord, trusting and obeying. And it's a site we are familiar with. It's a site that crops up all through Scripture. It's a place called The Place in Scripture. Bethel was, of course, the location where the altar was supposed to have been set up in the first place. Now ask yourself, has your service and your walk with Jehovah just been a case of you doing what you think would be good? This would be good. It's not what the Lord said, but it'd be good. I kind of like the idea. I like the sound of this. I'll do this. Is it dressed up all holy like a real act of devotion, but really just you putting on a good show whilst compromising and doing the thing that suits you best? Don't let it be that. Then Yaakov said to his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. 
This is what has happened to his family because he didn't take his vows seriously. Let us arise and go to Bethel and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. Yaakov knows he cannot take his sons to the holy place with innocent blood on their hands. They've just killed all the people in Shechem. And Kenna and he clothing and jewellery adorning them and with foreign gods from the house of Levan as well as from the plundered city of Shechem in their hearts. Therefore, we have the first detailed account of a community-wide teshuva. He calls his whole family to make teshuva. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Yaakov hid them under the oak tree which was by Shechem. I love the oak tree of Shechem. <laughs> I, can't, I can't go into it today, but while I was studying this, I also studied the oak tree of Shechem. And it always fascinated I don't know why, but one day I'll do a teaching on the oak tree of Shechem. <laughs> they were also told, change your garments, which in the Hebrew is... <laughs> I'm not very good at pronouncing Hebrew. <laughs> JP's good at it. V, v, <laughs> I'm not even going to say it. You can read it, can't you? So we were still change your garments. Hey, do you remember that, Mr. Ben? Yeah. Come on in. Change your garments. Have an adventure. Okay, I, I loved Mr. Ben. The Hebrew phrase does not mean your garments in the genetic sense of put on some different clobber. See, I can, sp I can speak English. I can say that. <clears throat> The underlying Hebrew noun in this phrase is similar, and this word literally means our outer image or surface likeness. It refers to what other human beings see when they look at you. It refers to the person you appear to be to others. He's telling us to put off our old image or likeness and to let the image or likeness in which the world sees us be made fresh and new. How about letting the world see you as Yehovah sees you when he looks at you and sees your true potential and value? Because Yehovah recognizes your true identity and he has written your destiny. How about letting the world see you as he sees you? Remember you're a light and the world is watching. All the time they're watching. You might not even think they're watching, but they are watching. And you're an ambassador to the king of kings. I was speaking to Joe last night. And saying, sometimes we take it lightly. You know, there's people, I think I said to you, there's people walking around all made up because they play for a Premier League football team. I think they're great. And get into restaurants probably, like, you know, ahead of the queue and all this, and think they're great. We're an ambassador for the King of Kings. Let us not take it lightly. What a thing to be. All scripture, remember, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You're the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And believe me, they are always watching you. And then they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Do you want to glorify your Father who is in heaven? And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. When we're fully surrendered to Yehovah, we need not fear man. When we're headed to the place he tells us to be, we don't need to fear man. As we said earlier, it is only when Yaakov fully surrenders to Yehovah that he can truly say, Yehovah is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? He's always working for us. Do you live in fear of man or have you fully surrendered? Do you fear Yehovah and acknowledge your Messiah or do you deny him by your actions and your words? Do you fear God or man? If you fear God, you will surrender to him. And when you surrender to him, you need not fear man. Will you surrender, confess and repent and hold on to Yehovah until he blesses you? Or will you continue trying to run away from your true identity and your destiny in Yehovah? He's going to have to bring you down. <clears throat> Is he going to have to rugby tackle you, as it were? I reckon you should just surrender. 
It's less painful. Hey! It really is. Have you fully surrendered to his plan, by the way? Not to your own almost plan of compromise and convenience. Where you build your own little altar and it all looks great from the outside and stuff. It's only when you're fully surrendered that you can walk with boldness and be a light. And you need not even fear, man. It says in verse 6, So Yaakov came to Lutz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel. He and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel. Because God appeared unto him. Uh, Because there God appeared unto him. And when he fled from the face of his brother. But Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak. And the name of it was called Alon Bachuth. And God appeared to Jacob again when he came out of Padan Aram. And he blessed him. Now he's where he's meant to be. And this is what the Lord says to him. Thy name is Yaakov, thy name shall not be called any more Yaakov, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee, I will give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went up from in the place where he talked with him. And Yaakov set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Yaakov called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. Finally, he's in the place where he's meant to be. <laughs> then the Torah portion mentions the birth of Benjamin and the death of Rachel. The sages note this was the single most difficult experience of Yaakov's troubled life. It says, And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Yaakov set a pillar upon her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. And Rachel is the only matriarch who is not buried in the cave of Machpelah. And according to tradition, Rachel's body was not brought to the cave because Yaakov prophetically foresaw that the Jews would pass by her burial place as they were being exiled to Babylon, and that she would tearfully plead to God on their behalf. Prophet Jeremiah, who foretold the destruction of the temple and the exile to Babylon, might have alluded to this story when he prophesied, Thus saith Jehovah, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted because they are no more. This actually is um, referring to something that Matthew speaks about, though. It says, The Gospel of Matthew, however, states, Jeremiah's prophecy was fulfilled when Herod the Great ordered the massacre of children in his failed attempt to murder the baby Yeshua. Now verse 21 says, And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar, and it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. What was Reuben doing? Somewhat distasteful sleeping with his father's concubine. And I got a lovely picture there (laughs) of Teddy looking like he does not approve. Not approved at all. He was trying to usurp his father's authority, by the way, by sleeping with his father's conky man. Then we have a description of the uh, 12 sons of Jacob. What's his card, David? I don't know. It's like a catalogue model, isn't he? <laughs> um, and these are the mothers, and this is how they all came down. Have a quick look. And then coming to a close, it says, And Yaakov came unto Isaac his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arbar, which is in Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were a hundred and four score years. He was a hundred and eighty. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died, and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Yaakov buried him. And chapter 36 is all about Esau's descendants. Perhaps the most striking thing we glean from the lengthy listing of Esau's wives and descendants that follows is the knowledge that from Esau will devolve 12 tribes. An exact parallel to the number of tribes we previously learned devolved from Yishmael to the number of tribes we know are going to devolve from Yaakov. So you've got 12, 12, and 12. So in closing, let's not be people that need to be bussed up by Yehovah. Let's not be legging it (laughs) and have the Lord come and need to bust us up here. Let us be this week people who get a tight hold of all that we can of Jehovah. 
Let's surrender to him and grab hold of him tight. Not letting you go. Let's not be people who forget the vows we've made to our great Elohim. Let's not take them lightly. Let's not be almost people. Let's instead be a people like glory Yehovah and do what it is that he would have us to do. Psalm 50 says, Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. 1 Peter says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Wow, he cares for us. How beautiful is that? All our striving is just daft. Surrender to him, he cares for you, he's going to take care of you, he looks after you. Just surrender to him. Psalm 27, Yehovah is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? Yehovah is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Don't be afraid and never deny Yeshua. Never deny him. And the things that you do are the things that you say. Don't fear man and what they might think about you and what they might want to do. He gives power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases strength. So call upon his name if you find yourself in times of trouble. Come before him with sacrifice. Present yourself as a living sacrifice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray that we would be not an almost people, Lord, but a people who take our vows to serve you really seriously. Help us, Lord, to be a light, I pray. Help us to walk in your truth. I ask you, Lord, that you'd help us to build each other up to keep ourselves as a people set apart. Lord, teach us to fear you and not man. And Lord, I don't want us to be a people who need to get bust up by you. I pray, Lord, for everyone here, I just pray that you'd speak to each of us in our hearts if there's anything in our lives that we haven't surrendered to you. Just help us, Lord, I pray, that we can bring it to you. Lord, let us be a people that do bring glory to your name. I thank you for everything that you're doing in each of our lives, Lord. I thank you that you do, you come along and you, you reveal yourself to each one of us and you speak over each one of us and you, you care for us and you love us. We love you, Heavenly Father, and we thank you. Thank you for all that you've spoken over us, for the great promises, and for what it cost you that we could be in covenant with you. I call you our God. Bless your holy name, Jehovah. Amen.